Welcome to bringing compression to Postgres at zero cost of performance, where our speaker will present a solution that allows Postgres users to achieve significant data storage savings through compression at zero CPU or performance cost. My name is Lindsay Hooper, and I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. I'm here with Tong Zhang, co-founder and chief scientist at ScaleFlux. Tom focuses on commercializing computational solid state storage drives, and he is currently a professor in the Electrical, Computer, and Systems Engineering Department at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Tong received his PhD degree in Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis in 2002. Welcome to Tong. Um, that's all I got. So with all of that, I'm going to hand it off to Tom. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really, um, really my great honor to have this opportunity um, to share our experience on developing a solution that uh, allows Postgres uh, benefit from data compression and meanwhile without uh, compromising its performance. So we know that uh, uh, Postgres um, on its own uh, does not compress the table data. So unless the record size is large, like uh, two kilobytes. So as a result, the end users um, have to rely on the underlying storage hierarchy in order to bring the data compression uh, into the picture. So apparently the first option is to run Postgres on file systems that support transparent compression, such as uh, ZFS and uh, BTRFS. So we know that internally, these um, file systems carry out block compression and the stores each compressed block over one or multiple 4K byte sectors on the storage device. So this uh, 4K byte alignment constraint causes pretty high storage space waste and degrades the overall compression ratio. So um, in order to improve the compression ratio, uh, we could either increase the block size, for example, from let's say eight kilobytes to 32 kilobytes as a one compression block. So uh, given this eight kilobyte database page size, Clearly, a larger compression block size will result in a higher read and the right, uh, uh, this read and the right amplification at the file system level. So this will further lead to a larger database performance degradation. So um, yeah, to improve the compression ratio, uh, another option um, is just to make those file systems apply more powerful compression algorithms. For example, like uh, instead of uh, uh, CPU light LZ4 compression, we could apply the standard or the lib compression to improve the compression ratio, of course, at, at the cost of CPU overhead. So this will um, also lead to um, larger database performance degradation. And moreover, in addition to such a fundamental compression ratio versus performance trade-off, um, ZFS and the BTRFS, uh, those file systems are far less popular than other like uh, journaling file systems like uh, ext4 and the XFS. Uh, but however, those journaling file systems on their own does not support trans transparent compression at all. So um, to support data compression, another option uh, is to use block layer with, uh, with built-in transparent compression, such as the VDO module in the latest Linux kernel. Uh, so here that op operating underneath the file system, such block layer module transparently compress each 4K byte block and uh, pack those multiple compressed blocks into one 4K byte sector. So compared with the file system level compression, 
the compression ratio of such a block um, of such a block layer um, module uh, unfortunately tend to be lower or even much lower. So uh, to improve the compression ratio, the only option here is to apply more powerful compression algorithm, uh, which of course will lead to a larger performance degradation. So uh, regardless of uh, using file system level or block layer transparent compression, the system or is always subject to a strict trade-off between the storage cost saving and the database performance degradation. Um, so moreover, due to the inherent implementation constraint, neither the file system level compression or nor the block layer uh, compression could achieve high compression ratio. So as a result, uh, today, like most end users, just typically just forget about data compression and just run Postgres on normal storage hierarchy and leaving those highly compressible data completely uncompressed on the storage device. And up to now, it seems like there's nothing we can do here, right? It's really, we have no other options. But actually, this is where the hardware people can come in to help. So that is how about let us to make each storage device capable of carrying out hardware-based compression, being completely transparent to the software stack. So this would bring the data compression back to the picture. And meanwhile, without suffering from the storage cost versus database performance trade-off. And such a storage device, we call that as a computational storage drive with uh, data path transparent compression. So in the remainder of this talk, I will discuss the very basics of, of, of such storage hardware and its application to Postgres. So as we know that uh, um, nowadays the CPU technology scaling is reaching to its limit and the computing infrastructure is uh, transitioning from a traditional CPU only homogeneous computing towards um, domain specific heterogeneous computing where certain computation tasks um, kind of uh, migrate from, from CPU to other computing engines, um, including the standalone PCIe uh, accelerators and smart network card that offloads networking processing, and also uh, computational storage drives that offload tasks such as uh, data compression and encryption from CPU. So altogether, they complement with CPU and uh, form a truly uh, heterogeneous computing infrastructure. So um, the basic concept behind the computational storage X X3 is very straightforward, very simple. We just make each storage drive be capable of performing certain heavy duty computation on the IO data pass. And this will form a highly distributed heterogeneous computing um, infrastructure that can maximize the computation parallelism with minimal extra data movement and the latency overhead. Um, so our company, Skillflex, has been leading the wave of computational storage and we are the first to launch computational storage product into commercial market. And uh, our current product uh, which is a special class of a computational storage drive with built-in data path transparent compression uh, has become GA early this year and being deployed worldwide. And the application mainly in around the database domain. So uh, actually recognizing this trend of a computational storage, the Storage Industry Association, SNEAR, has already commissioned a working group in charge of this uh, standardization, where the Skillflux is a founding member. 
and we received great response from industry and the membership a member in this uh, uh, working group just to uh, keep um, keep growing um, so in the heterogeneous computing landscape we just uh, talk about the regarding the commercialization of computational storage the data pass uh, trend data path tra transparent compression um, is apparently is the first low hanging fruit uh, to pick. And its basic idea is very simple. Just the compression is done um, in the hardware on the IO pass, completely transparent to the uh, OS and the user application. Our current product just to use a single FPGA to handle both flash control and uh, per 4K bytes ZLib compression. Uh, we implement flash translation layer in a kernel space driver that exposes the storage device uh, as a standard block device to the Linux block, block layer. It's, it's very easy to use. Um, so this cartoon further illustrates its difference from the current practice. So on the left-hand side is the current practice where we use either CPU or accelerator um, to handle data compression and deploy normal uh, SSD. Uh, the right hand side shows the computational storage drive with data pass, uh, with data pass transparent compression. Um, here, this, uh, a single FPGA combines the functionality of the flash control and the hardware compression, decompression, and then it's just a provide plug and play solution to the, uh, to the users as the drive can free up the host at CPU cycles and minimize the data movement and it enables the compression throughput to scale with the storage capacity. So um, really from the functionality perspective, the, the um, uh, computational storage drive with data pass compression is logically equivalent to the block layer transparent compression we just discussed earlier. So both of them just compress each 4K byte uh, user data uh, being completely transparent from the file system and the user application. However, from the implementation perspective, the computational storage drive integrates hardware-based ZLib compression, which can achieve much higher compression ratio at zero CPU cost. And moreover, it can tightly place all the compressed block uh, in flash memory without any storage space waste. So this can further boost the overall data compression ratio. So um, yeah, this figure compares the compression ratio of our, uh, our drive uh, with several mainstream um, compression libraries uh, like uh, LZ4, uh, Z standard, and the ZLib. So here we use a we use a Canterbury corpus file as a, as as a benchmark and set the compression block size at eight kilobytes uh, for all the compression libraries and align each compressed block to 4K byte boundary. So here, the result, we can clearly see that uh, the, the computational storage drive can achieve the best compression ratio, even compared with a very powerful um, compression uh, libraries like uh, Z standard and ZLib. So this so this slide shows the basic FIO testing um, and on uh, our drive and uh, competing high-end NVMe drive. Both are 3.2 terabytes. The FIO generate very highly um, I/O workload across the entire uh, 3.2 terabyte story space. The three figures here show the random IOPS when each IO request is a 4K byte, 8K byte, and 16K byte. So in, in each figure, the horizontal axis is a read percentage in the IO workload. So we can see that as a workload changes from the read intensive uh, to the write intensive, the IOPS of the normal NVMe drive significantly drops. Um, this simply because of their internal 
garbage collection overhead. And in comparison, in our drive, the built-in transparent compression can on the fly reduce the right data traffic. So leading to a much less internal garbage collection activity inside the drive. So as a result, really not surprisingly, um, our drive with built-in transparent compression can achieve much higher uh, random alps from this figure, more than like a, uh, two times higher. So now let's see uh, how the Postgres performs when we apply this kind of uh, uh, storage drive with built-in data path transparent compression. So here uh, we run five different sysbench workload on both our drive and a competing high-end NVMe drive. So here we keep all the Postgres parameters as their default settings. And the data, data set size is about two terabytes. Um, so even though um, Sysbench uh, generates data randomly, like uh, with a relatively low data compressibility, the results still show that uh, our drive can transparently compress the two terabyte data set to less than 800 gigabyte, representing about 60% uh, uh, of the storage cost reduction. So, and also this figure here shows the TPS of the five C-Spanch workload. We can see that uh, um, for write intensive workload, like uh, um, update non-index and update index, both our drive and the competing um, normal NVMe drive have pretty much the same TPS performance. So actually, at the first glance, this seems to contradict with the IFIO random IOPS comparison we just showed earlier here. Um, here, uh, our, the, our drive can achieve so much better random IOPS on the FIO testing, but it does not translate or reflect on the um, TP, Postgres TPS comparison. Actually, the main reason is that the data set size and the right IO intensity here um, are not large enough to trigger the garbage collection inside the normal NVMe drive. So therefore, both drives do not experience the internal garbage collection. And as a result, they tend to have similar performance under the right intensive workload. And meanwhile, we can see that the read intensive workload actually have noticeably better TPS performance on the, on the drive with transparent compression. So then where the gain comes from, um, actually the reason is that by compressing each eight kilobyte page, um, it can reduce the probability that different read requests uh, access the same flash memory chip. So that means we can reduce the flash memory die access conflict. This will lead to higher page read throughput. And so that will uh, give us the higher TPS under the read intensive workload. So then for, from this result, we can show, we can see that uh, uh, we not only can reduce the storage cost transparently, and at the same time, we can even improve the performance. And so that is a really straightforward usage. So beyond this uh, use case, actually we can go uh, one step further to make uh, Postgres take even more advantage of a storage drive with built-in transparent compression. So uh, first, um, we all know that Postgres use a parameter called the fuel factor to control the amount of space reserved in, uh, like, uh, in each page for future updates. Um, clearly, the, the value of the fuel factor directly determines the trade-off between the database performance and the storage cost. Um, let's say like if we reduce the uh, fuel factor to leave more space for future updates, 
in each database page, the database performance will improve, especially on the right intensive workload. But meanwhile, the storage cost will also accordingly increase. So as a result, Postgres by default uh, tend to set the fuel factor at 100. Uh, that means uh, do not reserve any space within each page for future update in order to minimize the storage cost. Um, actually, like interestingly, uh, once Postgres runs on storage drive with transparent compression, the storage overhead caused by the reserved space will just largely disappear because the Postgres initialized the reserved space as all zero and the transparent compression can highly compress the all zero segments. So this naturally enables uh, Postgres more aggressively set the fuel factor without sacrificing the physical storage cost. So um, to better illustrate this, uh, let's see this cartoon, like uh, let the blue and the black dots represent the operating points where uh, when using the hour drive and the normal NVMe drive. Uh, with the default fuel factor of 100, they have the pretty much the same performance. And our drive can reduce, transparently reduce the physical storage cost by half through the transparent compression. And once we reduce the fuel factor, let's say to 50, so under the normal NVMe drive, the storage cost directly almost like a double and also performance improves. So it's very clear trade-off between the performance and the storage cost. And meanwhile, under our drive with transparent compression, actually we can expect the same performance uh, improvement. But meanwhile, the storage cost remains almost unchanged. So to, to better demonstrate this, we, we further carried out um, the sysbench TPCC benchmarking. Um, here we consider the two, uh, we consider the two different um, data set. Um, on the left-hand side is a 740 gigabyte. On the right-hand side is a 1.4 terabyte. The, the result shows that uh, as we reduce the fuel factor from 100, to 75, the TPS performance will improve by about 33%. Uh, uh, under normal NVMe drive, the physical storage space just jumps from 740 gigabyte to 900 gigabyte, or like a 1.4 terabyte to 1.7 terabyte. But in comparison, under our drive with transparent compression, we see the same 33% TPS performance improvement. And the meanwhile, the physical storage space only very slightly increase, let's see, from uh, one, 178 gigabyte to 189 gigabyte, or from 342 gigabyte to 365 gigabyte. So this study very clearly shows that uh, by configuring the fuel factor parameter, actually Postgres can very nicely take much better advantage of the underlying transparent compression to further improve the TPS performance and without compromising the storage, storage cost saving. So um, actually to materialize the storage cost saving for end users our drive can uh, expose a logical storage capacity that is much larger than the physical storage capacity, for example, like a four by two times, four times, or even more. Of course, like due to the, uh, the runtime data compression ratio variation, users must be able to monitor the physical storage space usage and accordingly manage the data storage. So in, in this context, we provide two levels of support 
first we provide IOCTO and uh, CISFS um, API for users just to runtime query um, the physical storage space usage. This can be easily integrated into existing storage space management um, environment. And also to make things even simpler, we also provide a space balancer tool that runs as a background daemon to ensure that file system will never run out of physical storage space before using up the total logical storage space. So, um, so really up to now, we have been kind of mainly um, focusing on scale flux computational storage drive that can perform hardware uh, based transparent compression. Actually, we are not alone. Like we are not the only company in this area. Like uh, uh, storage hardware with built-in transparent compression is now quickly becoming very pervasive. For example, like uh, almost all the all flash array products uh, from the Dell, uh, HPE, and the Pure Storage, uh, they natively support built-in hardware-based transparent compression. And the storage drive with um, built-in transparent compression are also being commercialized by Seagate and many similar products are coming to the market very soon. And moreover, the cloud vendors like Amazon, Microsoft, they also started to deploy hardware compression capability in their cloud environment. So this will make the cloud native transparent compression um, will be available in, in the very near future. So therefore, um, now it may be a, a right time for the database community to study how the uh, relational database could take full advantage of such new storage hardware. So in the following, I will just present the two very simple ideas along this direction and would love to explore deeper engagement with the Postgres community. So the first idea is we just uh, apply a dual in-memory versus on-storage um, page format in Postgres, which can further improve the data compression ratio on the uh, storage hardware with built-in transparent compression. Again, the idea is very simple, just the motivated by the column store. Um, so when a page, when a database page stays in the database uh, cache memory, we simply just keep the conventional role based format. And when flashing a page from a database cache memory into uh, the storage, the database itself just on the fly converts into a column-based format and apply some CPU light transformation like uh, XOR or shuffle to each column to improve the data compressibility. So that's a very simple idea. So to demonstrate this uh, simple concept, actually we, we, are, we already use the InnoDB as a, as a test vehicle and the result shows that uh, uh, we can improve the, we can further boost the data compression ratio by another 40% um, at very minimal performance impact. So uh, it would be very interesting to see how this idea could be integrated into, uh, into Postgres. Uh, you know, uh, into Postgres uh, kind of environment. Um, so um, the second idea is about uh, to reduce the write I/O traffic uh, caused by the full page write in the write header log in Postgres. So we know that uh, Postgres applies full page write uh, to warrant to, to enhance the reliability, uh, enhance the database storage reliability at the cost of uh, higher write IO traffic. So uh, for write intensive workload, this could lead to a very noticeable performance degradation. 
So the idea here is that uh, by leveraging the transparent compression, we just uh, simply pad zeros into the Red Hat log so that each 8K byte um, full page um, is always aligned with a 4K byte boundary without sacrificing the storage cost because we can highly compress all the zeros. And meanwhile, uh, we can um, leverage the file range clone feature in file systems to clone the 8K byte full page from the table space into the Red Hat log because right now the 8K byte in the Red Hat, Red Hat log just exactly cover two 4K byte sectors. So then we can use borrow the uh, leverage this file system level uh, clone feature. So um, although the file systems like ZFS and the BTRFS can support file range clone from the very beginning. Uh, the journaling file system, uh, XFS, just uh, started to support this uh, uh, file range clone very, very recently. So that really enabled a very nice opportunity. So this would make it possible to, to realize the full page write simply through a write range clone instead of physically write the whole 8K byte data into the right hand log. So as a result, we can completely eliminate the write, um, this, the write IO traffic caused by the full page write in the right hand log. Um, this um, not, only can, um, not only can help to increase the flash memory endurance, um, but also can improve the database performance dramatically, especially under the right intensive workload. So that is another kind of a, a very simple idea just to, to can we can very nicely leverage this transparent compression and the file clone from the file system level to, uh, to, to keep this uh, full page write uh, feature and without triggering the physical write uh, traffic. Okay. So in conclusion, um, the emerging storage hardware with built-in transparent compression is indeed um, is a perfect match with Postgres. And without changing a single line of code, Postgres can very nicely benefit from such storage hardware in terms of both storage cost and the performance. Moreover, like if we are willing to slightly modify the source code um, there could be a much larger spectrum for Postgres to take even better advantage of such storage hardware. And we just uh, present the two simple ideas as just as, as simple examples. So um, again, that uh, at Steel Flux, we, we really sincerely look forward to working with the uh, Postgres community to explore how Postgres could take full advantage of such new storage hardware. So I would say there's future opportunities. So with that, this ends my talk. Thank you very much. I would love to answer any, any questions. Okay, first question has come in. Have you done any tests on distributed databases? No, not yet. We, uh, our, our testing were done by just a standalone, like a single server, like a MySQL, Postgres, you know, oracles. But uh, I would guess that regardless of either whether it's a distributed or not, uh, as long as the users have the demand to save storage costs and the result impacting the performance, then our drive should, should be able to help. But still, we haven't done any uh, concrete testing on the true distributed, distributed uh, database. Thank you. Um, another question. Are the two ideas for changes to Postgres complementary to the compression? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so really, those two ideas we just presented are just uh, uh, purely in the context of the Postgres. It's really um, the, the objective 
is just to take better advantage of the underlying uh, compression capability built in in the storage hardware. So it's uh, uh, just try to take advantage of the existing um, transparent compression capability. Great. What is needed to engage for a POC? Oh yeah, just uh, actually we're we're very open to any potential POCs. Just uh, shoot us an email, then we can arrange this uh, POC. Either we can just uh, we can set up an environment in our uh, server room, then the users can just remotely run um, um, run their testings on our drive, or we can provide uh, a drive uh, to to the interested parties, then they can just run in their own environment, either way. So um, the, again, the drive, our, our product uh, is already kind of a GA and uh, we are under very active POCs, like over 60 POCs uh, all over the world, uh, mainly in the, uh, in the database community and in, the, in this database domain. So we have received very, very positive feedback uh, from many like end users, like from hyperscaler to enterprise, uh, they see it's really kind of a, a saving costs and improving performance and without any overhead on the CPU. So it's really kind of a free, almost like a free lunch. So uh, yeah, we are really welcoming any kind of discussion on the POCs or collaboration. Great, and have any third parties replicated your results? Um, yes, yeah. So uh, actually, we are uh, we already have one independent I think, uh, consultant in China. Uh, actually, he uh, he run the testing on on their environment, and actually, they even show even better performance uh, improvement than what we have uh, in, in internally. And they already published uh, some blog and you know, some uh, materials online. And also, we are also engaging with some other uh, other third parties. Like uh, they will just uh, run testings and they will publish their results and publish in their blog very soon. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, so now with that, I want to thank you, Tong, for being here. I want to thank everyone for spending a little bit of their Wednesday with us. Um, and I hope to see you all at the next Postgres conference webinar. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you.